Morning Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I am James Barty in Washington. Today is Monday, January 16th, and here are some of the stories we are covering. From a Tanzanian opposition presidential candidate returns home next week from exile. I'm returning home to work because the great work of transforming the country politically is facing the nation. Liberia's former vice president and potential 2023 presidential candidate is out of the hospital after four days. A Roman Catholic bishop says February elections are consequential and Nigerians cannot afford to sit on the fence. UNICEF delivers anti-cholera supplies to Malawi. Zimbabwe's main opposition party says pre-election climate is unfree and undemocratic as police disperse an opposition meeting and arrest 25 members. There is a deliberate attack and the agenda to try and destroy the authentic opposition. That's why they treat us as a band organization. There is no law that allows the police to raid our private meetings and for us to seek clearance from the police. And the WHO says healthcare facilities in poor countries lack reliable electricity. Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. The former presidential candidate of Tanzania's main opposition, Chadema Party, says he will return to Tanzania on January 25th. Tundu Lesu fled the country two years ago to Europe following the contentious 2020 presidential election because he said his life was threatened. His decision to return home comes after President Samia Suluhu Hassan earlier this month lifted the ban on opposition rallies imposed six years ago by her predecessor, the late President John Magufuli. Lesu tells me he is returning home to get back to work in transforming Tanzania democratically. I have always maintained that Tanzania is where I belong. And therefore, returning home after a lengthy spell in exile is a matter of great happiness to me. In one of my interviews with you, you were doubtful that uh, President uh, Samia Suluhu Hassan was a reformist in contrast to her predecessor, the late President John Magu Fule. Do you have a change of mind now that she has lifted the ban on opposition rallies? In her first one year of her administration, President Samia Slu Hassan gave us many reasons to be skeptical about her reformist credentials. But in all fairness to her, she has changed significantly from that time. It's not only Mr. Mbowe who was released and the charges against him dropped, but uh, there were over 400 political prisoners belonging to our party alone who were in prison, and she has released them all. She has initiated a dialogue with our party, and as a result of these initiatives, as a result of these efforts, she has eventually lifted the illegal ban on political activity that had been in place for seven long years. And so it is fair to say that while the beginning was not promising, she has changed tack and she is moving in the right direction, and that's why I'm returning home. You said in your tweet that you are returning home to get back to work. Does this include another run for the presidency in 2024? I'm returning home to work because the great work of transforming the country politically is facing the nation. The great work of making sure that the country gets a new democratic constitution is one of the biggest agendas of our party for many years. So when I say that it is time to get back to work, it is to get back to work to create the necessary conditions for Tanzania to be a true democracy. And uh, as to elections, those will be determined when we have the right conditions legally and institutionally for free, fair and credible elections. And at that time, the decision will be made obviously by my party and myself, whether I want another tilt for the presidency or not. You had said, Mr. Lesu, that uh, in order for you to return home, the government must guarantee your safety. 
do you have such assurance or guarantee? I have always maintained that for me to return to Tanzania, there must be security assurances. As you know, for someone who survived uh, such a terrible assassination attempt as I did, this is not asking for a lot, I hope. I'm happy to say that uh, when I met the president in February of last year in, in Brussels, when she came for the EU-AU summit, and we had a, an hour-long uh, discussion, a talk, uh, she promised me personally that uh, I'll be safe. And that promise was followed by a public statement made in parliament by the Minister for Home Affairs, who is in charge of internal security. So what the president told me personally in Brussels and the ministerial statement in parliament are sufficient guarantees, in my view, to enable me to return home. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Lisu. Uh, it's always very nice to talk with you. Happy New Year to you. And a very happy New Year to you and yours, Mr. Bati. Tundu Lesu is the former presidential candidate for Tanzania's main opposition, Chadema Party. You are speaking with me from TNN, Belgium. A spokesperson for Zimbabwe's main opposition party says the government is in panic mode as the country prepares for elections later this year by targeting the opposition. Gift Ostalos Siziba, who is the deputy spokesperson for the opposition Citizens Coalition for Change, the CCC, says the pre-election environment is headed toward an unfree and undemocratic Zimbabwe. The police on Saturday dispersed an opposition meeting in the capital Harare and arrested 25 members. They said the meeting was not authorized and therefore a violation of the country's Maintenance of Peace and Order Act. Deputy Triple C spokesperson Siziba tells me their gathering was a private one and there is no law in Zimbabwe that requires police permission to hold a private meeting. We had our meetings uh, happening in Harare with our members, which is a private meeting of our party, uh, where we are meeting with people in different parts of the country. And when we had our first meeting in Budiriro, the police pounced and arrested uh, our national organizing secretary and 25 other leaders from uh, the different rank and file of Triple C in a private residence of one of our members of parliament, Honorable Majingauda. The police say your gathering was not approved in line with uh, Zimbabwe's Maintenance of Peace and Order Act. Did you get permission before the gathering? Look, uh, the law in Zimbabwe is very clear. Um, I've just sent you the screenshot of uh, the section that covers, you know, meetings. Uh, When there are public meetings, uh, that's when we seek approval from the police. Uh, These were private meetings. We've done them before. But now, of course, as we enter into the shadows of the election, the regime is in panic and has pressed the panic button. And that's why it is turning against ordinary people and Triple C as the target. That has been the trend since the formation of our new movement. There is a deliberate uh, attack and the agenda to try and destroy the authentic opposition. Uh, that's why they treat us as a band organization. There is no law that allows uh, you know, the police to raid our private meetings and for us to seek uh, clearance from the police. And that as it may, ZANPF is holding its meetings uh, without clearance from the police, whether private or public. Perpetrators of political motivated violence are walking scot-free. So Zimbabwe is an animal farm kingdom where there are laws for ZANPF and laws for the rest of us ordinary people and those in the opposition. So that is the situation in the country. The state has turned against its own citizen, particularly as we head to elections. What is the status of those uh, arrested? Yes, we had 26 of our members uh, being arrested yesterday, including women and children. And of course, and unfortunately, we had uh, some of our members assaulted. Uh, we know when the police raided our private venue, which is the residence of one of our members of parliament for that matter. And also shockingly to show that uh, Zimbabwe has turned into a full-throat one-party state and a ten-part dictatorship. You saw the harassment, assault, and arrest of one of our legal practitioners who had gone to represent our members, lawyer advocate Kazere, who was arrested and has been detained. Instead, for the police to arrest the perpetrators, is actually a victim who has been taken and arrested. Zimbabwe is to vote in presidential election later this year. How would you describe the political climate leading up to the election? 
Look, uh, the political climate in Zimbabwe is very tense. Um, we are still grappling with um, the delimitation uh, report right now, which is bearing on the exact date we're supposed to be holding election. And it's clear from the rancor that you see from uh, the commission that uh, there is elite discohesion and lack of elite consensus within the state itself. That's why these contradictions. So that is the environment around which we're having this election. It's a clear election without democracy. The pre-election environment right now is demonstrating and leading Zimbabwe towards a very chaotic and an unfree and undemocratic environment. Gift Ostalos Siziba is the deputy spokesperson for Zimbabwe's main opposition Citizens Coalition for Change. He was speaking with me from the capital, Harare. In Nigeria, the Catholic Bishop of Sokoto Diocese says the February 25th general election are consequential and registered voters cannot afford to sit on the fence. Matthew Kuka says Nigerians have every right to be apathetic and to feel disempowered because of persistent corruption by elected officials, the inability of the political elite to address national concerns, and insecurity. But Bishop Kuka hopes Nigerian youth can channel their anger into votes that will hopefully allow the country to address issues affecting their common survival. He tells me he's hopeful that this year's vote will be transparent because it is the first time that technology will play a major part in how the elections are conducted. First of all, you know, this is a, a moment defining election, so to say. You know, Nigeria is, is in a very, very difficult situation. The sense of who we are as a nation is uh, severely under threat. We've had four or five years of endless attacks by bandits and Boko Haram. We've been over, over 10 years now. We have a climate of anxiety and fear. Uh, poverty, inequality has grown astronomically. The economy has uh, not performed as we expected, uh, a lot of other factors, but Nigerians have uh, witnessed uh, has the worst form of poverty, you know. So there's a lot of anxiety. I mean, we're not expecting any miracles, but I, we just believe that uh, this is not a time for Nigeria to sit on the fence or to even have the luxury of debating whether we will or we wouldn't. The electoral body has already sent out very positive signals about the progress it has made in eliminating some of the areas that have always led to the manufacture of election results and so on. So really, these elections are perhaps one of Nigeria's most significant elections. It sounds to me, Bishop, that you fear there is apathy or you sense apathy. Well, I mean, you know, I have said severally, the majority of the Nigerian citizens have earned every right to be cynical and to wonder whether their votes really uh, make any difference. This is largely because of the fact that electoral practices are one of our electoral processes. But even more importantly, is the fact that um, the hopes of Nigerians have never really seriously been met. The inability of the Nigerian political elite to very quickly address issues regarding even just basic human security and human survival, you know, to really do much more than the realities they meet on the ground. And the, the fact that corruption persists and literally has become an ideological substitute for what governance ought to be all about. And Nigerians feel totally disempowered. They can see members of the political class are uh, humongously rich. Uh, they also know that people in the National Assembly are all strata of political life are far richer, they are living lives that are in excess of what they are contributing to the larger society. So every Nigerian is literally right to ask, you know, what am I doing this for? But um, I think we have the young people who constitute the majority of the citizens of this country are angry. And I think that their anger is a positive indication that uh, perhaps the most important challenge will be if they can channel their anger and frustration properly and make the right choices, you know, that will hopefully place our country in a position in which we can begin to address the issue of our common survival. Now, this election coming February, there are many, many candidates here. I mean, the two top candidates, the vice president who's running and uh, Atiku. Now, we have a new candidate in the person of Peter Obi, who is not part of the establishment, I would say. What are you sensing in terms of how Nigerians are looking at the election coming? That's why I said this is a defining moment for our country. You know, we are witnessing the energy of young people in a way and manner that hasn't really been part and parcel of our politics. 
the entrance of uh, a new generation of uh, other actors has also heightened and raised the hopes of many Nigerians. So Nigerians have very critical choices to make, and it's about looking at the past, gauging it with the present, and then wondering what kind of a future there, you know, there might be. I think the good news is that um, we hope carefully that these elections have all the ingredients of being transparent, hopefully, in part because it is the first time that technology is going to have a role to play in how the elections are conducted. Bishop Kuka, thank you so much. A pleasure speaking with you. Happy New Year. Thank you, John. The same to you. God bless you. That was Matthew Kuka, the Catholic Archbishop of Sokoto Diocese in Nigeria. He was speaking with me from Sokoto. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on the Voice of America. I am James Barty in Washington. Today is Monday, January 16. The chair of Liberia's former ruling United Party says former Vice President Joseph Wakai and soon-to-be standard bearer of the party in the 2023 presidential election is healthy and ready to rescue the country from what Luther Tape calls greedy politicians who are only concerned about themselves. This after the former vice president, who is 78 years old, spent four days last week at a local hospital in the capital, Monrovia. Boakai served as vice president during former President Ellen Johnson's Salif's two terms in office. Party chair Luther Tapez says Boakai checked himself into the hospital for a routine checkup, but doctors found that his blood pressure was high and recommended that he needed to rest. Tape tells me the former vice president was released over the weekend and, and is resting comfortably at home. As you may know, our vice president is a very hard-working man, and uh, a few days ago he decided to check himself out in the ELW hospital, a local Christian hospital, and then he found out that his pressure was a bit high, and so the doctor advised him to take some bare rest, and at the same time they tried to uh, help uh, normalize his pressure. So... Family, party, stalwarts, and well, we just advised him to take some time and rest. And so he's been at the Adebe Hospital. Based on the doctor's uh, professional advice, they will feel now very satisfied of medically to let him return to his home today. And so he was uh, discharged and he's currently at his house meeting friends and uh, well, we just... As you know, he's not just a former vice president, uh, but he's a potential presidential candidate for this year's election, 2023 election. And so is there any reason that the Liberian people should be more concerned about his health? Uh, Well, at this point, I would say, frankly speaking, there is no major reason to be concerned about his health. It's kind of normal uh, at his age to seek medical attention when necessary. But at this junction, and what I know as the chairman of the party, is his faith. And of course, with his doctors, they have been monitoring his pressure, his health, and they have... uh, clearly indicated that it's not a major reason to be concerned. So uh, at this point, Liberians home and abroad should relax. There's no reason to panic. The former vice president, who is also our standard bearer, is doing pretty well health-wise, and he's going to run. Uh, there's no major medical problem that the doctor saw during his four days in the hospital. And so let Liberian people relax. Mr. Boykai is going to contest on the United Party. And of course, uh, Mr. Boti, I tell you, uh, this man believes so much in Liberia. Unlike the President George Weir and his uh, ministers, who are the slightest opportunity of any health uh, problem, they will jump out of the country and go seek medical attention in neighboring Ghana, in Saudi Arabia, and other parts of the world. But this man believes so much in the local professional medical doctors here, and uh, so that's what he has done. And of course, when he become president this year, we want to strengthen the medical facilities for not only him, but all Liberians to have good medical care. And so we are very pleased to uh, inform the Liberian people that there's no reason to panic. Mr. Justin Mamboy Kato Senebera is faith and ready to run for office. Do you understand why people are concerned about his health? Well, Mr. Bodhi, he's 78. And of course, the Liberians home and abroad have every reason 
to be concerned because from all indications, there is no one politically formidable to defeat President Weir than Joseph Nyumabwakai. And that's why when the, the news filtered into the public domain that uh, Mr. Bwakai was being hospitalized, it claims the attention of Liberians from went abroad. As the chairman of the party, I want to assure Liberians that uh, Mr. Bwakai on his own checked himself into a local hospital. And uh, the medical advice of the doctors, he was there for four days. And as I'm speaking to you right now, he's home with his family and friends. That was Luther Tape, the chairperson of Liberia's opposition Unity Party. You are speaking with me from the Liberian capital, Monrovia. The United Nations Children's Agency, UNICEF, has handed over life-saving supplies worth about $300,000 to support Malawi's fight against a cholera outbreak which has killed more than 700 people, including 104 children, since it began in March. Lamek Masina reports from Blantyre. The supplies include acute water diarrhea kits, high-performance stints, antibiotics, and other medicines and medical supplies. The donation follows Malawi President Lazarus Chakwela's December 5 declaration of a public health emergency and appeal for local and international support in the fight against the cholera outbreak. Rudolf Schwenk is the country representative for UNICEF in Malawi. We will continue to support the Ministry of Health to scale up the cholera response. And we fully appreciate the tireless efforts from frontline health and community workers to manage the influx of cholera cases. With more than 6,200 children already affected and more than 100 deaths, the spread of this outbreak is a threat to the health and well-being of children. UNICEF says it secured the supplies and chartered a special flight to Malawi with support from the European Civil Protection and Humanitarian Aid Operations. Statistics from the Public Health Institute of Malawi show that as of Thursday, the disease had killed 773 people, including 104 children, and resulted in 23,217 cases since the outbreak started in March last year. Maziko Matemba is Community Health Ambassador in Malawi. He says the supplies come at a time when Malawi is in critical need of them. This call upon on government and uh, its key stakeholders to find a mechanism on how to prepare emergency of this nature because they, they will be keep on coming. Cholera is an acute diarrheal infection caused by ingesting food or water contaminated with bacteria. The disease affects both children and adults and if untreated, can kill within hours. The Malawi Minister of Health says the fatality rate of the outbreak is now at 3.33%, much higher than the recommended 1% global threshold. Lamek Masina for VUA News, Blanta, Malawi. A new report finds that nearly a billion people in the world's poorer countries are treated for often life-threatening conditions in healthcare facilities that lack a reliable electricity supply. A joint report by the World Health Organization, the World Bank, and the International Renewable Energy Agency Energizing Health, Accelerating Electricity Access in Healthcare Facilities has just been issued. Lisa Schlein reports for VOA from Geneva. Health officials say electricity access in healthcare facilities can make the difference between life and death. Heather Adair Rohani is acting unit head, air quality, energy, and health at the World Health Organization. She says it is critical that healthcare facilities have a reliable, always functioning electricity supply available. Imagine going to a healthcare facility with no lights, with no opportunity to have a baby warmer functioning, to have medical devices uh, functioning and powered at all the time. It's absolutely fundamental that we have this electricity. This is often overlooked infrastructure aspect of healthcare facilities that are, is desperately needed to continue to provide care to those most vulnerable populations in low and middle income countries. Lisa Schlein for VOA News, Geneva. And that's it for this Monday, January 16th edition of Daybreak Africa. We thank you for beginning your week with us. For more Africa news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. On behalf of the Daybreak Africa crew, I am James Barty, Washington, wishing that you will have a great week.